Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual bestseller author talk with Angela Starrett. Uh, Angela is the author of Unbroken, My Fight for Survival, Hope, and Justice for Indigenous Women and Girls. We are so happy to have you all joining us this evening. We are going to get started. So my name is Dahlia. I am a community branch librarian on unceded Cowitson territory in what's known as Duncan, BC on Vancouver Island. It has been an honor to create, coordinate and host tonight's event that is being recorded. Thank you for joining us. And I would also like to acknowledge the uh, Staminas, Laaxon, Malahat, Tubasset, Halalt and Penelicate peoples. For centuries, these nations walked gently on the unceded lands where I now live and work. We'd love to hear where you're joining us from, so please share in the chat box on the bottom of your screen. Verl's service area runs from Haida Gwaii in the north to Sydney North Saanich in the south. Um, and it includes the Coast Salish, Haida, Haltsuk, Kwakwakiwak, Nuchana, and Newhawk people that have been stewards of the land since time immemorial. Burl serves 53 of First Nations, 27% of all First Nations in BC, 30% of all distinct First Nation language groups in Canada. So welcome. I'd also like to introduce uh, Staminas Penelicate Knowledge Keeper, Patrick Alec Jr. Zwalapathut, who is going to share a song or two with us and welcome us this evening. Um, my mother comes from Stamin or Penelicate, and my father comes from Staminas, Patrick Alec Jr. or Patrick Alec Sr. and Laura Lee James, um, my grandmother, um, Marguerite James um, raised me. She also comes from Penalcat Island and Galliano Island. Also, my great grandmother, Mary Jo, also comes from Penalcat and Galliano Island. I have one daughter. She is three years old. Um, she lives in the United States, um, Belfair, Washington. I want to acknowledge uh, Dahlia for. Pretty doing pretty good on the Trump Punch Nations on the on the all the nations there. Um, so I'm thank you for putting in the effort. I see you. Um, I really want to thank the author and our guest here for coming. I'm going to be singing a song called "Our Women Are Sacred," and I um I made the song with my grandmother. Um. It's really a song to put women back in a place of honor and to uplift women and to remind yourself that you're you're meant to be here. And and my grandma emphasizes putting women back in the place of honor. So um it's really to really uplift women and remind women that you're strong. You're really strong and um, and to stand in your strength now. And that's kind of what the song is saying. And because um, I didn't want to make a sad song, I wanted to make a strong song. And it was an elder who from Snenemuch. Yeah, I want to, I want to acknowledge Snenemuch, uh, Ms. Dimuch, for sharing at our longhouse with us. You know, these past winters, you know, um, I, I believe we've always been neighbors um, and we've always borrowed sugar and flour and whatever the, the settlers brought or we've always shared together, you know, uh, always. We've always canoed and visited each other. Um, you know, our our longhouse was being renovated in Stamanis. So, um, um, Snanemo allowed us to bunk beds, I guess you could say. And uh, so I, 
I, I say it that way instead of saying I'm going to acknowledge you know, like the land I'm on. Like th that's what we've been doing the past few years is sharing a longhouse. So th this year, our next winter, our longhouse will be open. And um, so I just really want to say that. I think we've always worked together as one, not so much in Chihuahua. So, yeah, I just really want to say again, uh, the song I'm singing is to put women back in a place of honor and to remember to stand tall now and to remember who you are. And, um, yeah, it's it's an honor to sing this song. And, um, you know, I'm thankful for the ancestors and the creator for giving me the gift of composing and singing my own songs and now they're family songs. So um, I sing, I sing it with my sisters now and, um, and they did it on their own. You know, they wanted to sing. I didn't force them. So yeah. And my grandma just loves this song. So I'll sing that now. And uh, it's a fun My apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, been busy today, but uh, really want to honor the women, all our women, and to remember who you are and stand tall, stand tall in who you are. And that song is to honor all women. And it's a fairly new song. And um, actually coming out with an album here soon. And uh, working on a children's book. Um, so, you know, I really want to acknowledge the, the Vancouver Island Library. I used to work for the library back in the day. I was a page. And uh, so I really appreciate the library, libraries, and I, I do drum circles at the, the Nanaimo Library, um, Harbor Front. Um, we have to meet again to reschedule more, but uh, we usually do it the second, second Thursday, yeah. second Thursday of every month at five thirty to seven. But uh, again. Excuse my language. I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I offended anybody. Um, but yeah, and sorry for the technical difficulties. And uh, I just want to thank the guests for for being here and uh, spreading a good message, important message. Hi, Patrick. Thank you so much. Uh, so again, uh, a warm welcome, everyone. I'd now like to introduce Angela. Angela Starrett is an award-winning investigative journalist and national best-selling author from the Gixon Nation on her dad's side and from Belle, I Belle Island, Newfoundland on her maternal side. 
Angela worked as a television, radio, and digital journalist at CBC for more than a decade. She hosted the award-winning CBC original podcast, Land Back. She lives on the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh in Vancouver. And Angela's debut memoir, Unbroken, My Fight for Survival, Hope, and Justice for Indigenous Women and Girls, became a national bestseller within days of its 2023 release. So a very warm welcome. Um, I do want to mention uh, from the start uh, to please uh, everyone uh, engage in self-care. Uh, should you need to reach out, I've put a list of uh, support lines in the chat so please do reach out um, if if you need to and um, please uh, wait until the end uh, we will have a, a question and answer session um, uh, toward the end of our uh, event tonight uh, and so uh, I ask that you uh, only put questions in the uh, Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen and, and wait and, until the end uh, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. All right, so Angela, um, can you tell us what, um, was it always a memoir you wanted to write? Uh, how did it come about? And uh, can you tell us about the writing and publication process for the book? Uh, yeah, so first I just wanna say hello to, to all the guests. It's really beautiful seeing where you're all from. Um, I am on Musqueam, Holmish, and Tsleil-Waututh territory in Kim Kimalai, which is also known as Vancouver. And, um, I'll uh, also say my Gixan name is Lualgia Dumk Beast. Um Simgiget to get him Han Gantkabal Wolksit, Luam Godi, Wingget Asam, Atamiuksa Tan uh Wobaxun, Angela Starrett Will Lualgia Dumk Beast Waya Walter Starrett La uh Walter Starrett Yea Wolps Wiak Lakibu Gixan Lakyep. So I just said my name is Lual Gyatum Kbist, which is my Gixan name. I was gifted that name last June, um, June 21st. And I like to share a little bit before I begin about who I am. So I'm I'm white on my mom's side. I think it's really important for white people to not only explain, you know, the power and the privilege that we have as white people, but also to really investigate our roots and find out where we're from. That's so important. Um, a lot of my colleagues will just say, I'm Canadian. I love being Canadian because I can be whatever I want. And that's a power and a privilege in itself. So on my mom's side, I've been doing a lot of investigation to find out that we're Irish, um, but we're also from the Isles of, of Jersey on um, the English side and really learning about what that means and how it came to be that my ancestors on my white side, you know, came here, created systems, created power systems, created power dynamics, created settler society, and also tacitly consented to some of the colonial systems that harmed Indigenous people. Um, it's also really important to investigate that side of myself to be able to relate. You know, a lot of my people on my white side survived many, many pandemics. And to have that point of relation and that point of trauma, what were my people on that side running from where they came and did what they did here, living in such scarcity and trauma mode. So on my Gixan side, um, I'm Gixan. My grandfather, Walter Starrett, was groomed much of his young life to be the hereditary chief of Wiga, the house of the big wings. And he was brought small gifts when he was a young boy to sort of um, let him know that that would be the role that he would grow into. He actually said no to the role in modern day context. It's a lot of money, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of resources. So he actually said no to the role and his brother, Neil Starrett, who passed on last a couple of years ago at the young age of 106 or seven, he became Wigak for most of his life. And so it's really, um, I think important to to state who I am and where I'm from. My name um, was gifted to me by um, my elder Chuis, 
And it actually means woman who works in television and radio, which is kind of oh. funny now because I no longer do. The literal translation is talks in a box. So it's also a very humbling name. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a little bit about who I am. Um, and to your question, yeah, it's been a quite a whirlwind releasing the book in May of last year. Um, it's been received really well. It was a bestseller. That was a big surprise for me. Yeah. Um, and it's been a wonderful process, but, um, yeah, I think your question was about memoir. Why was the decision to write a memoir? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, how, how, how that, that came about, like, um, you know, wa wanting to write memoir, um, and then, yeah, like the, the process for, you know, blending that memoir with, um, you know, your your own work and um you know cr creating this e extremely powerful and incredible uh, uh book that yeah yeah so when i first started writing the book um very early on it was actually going to be kind of a fictionalized story of my life which for whatever reason actually seemed like it was more traumatic there was more details that were going to be required for a fiction book. And I went to the Banff Center of the Arts um, and actually worked with a number of incredible Indigenous authors, Wabi Gidjip Rice, Cherie Demeline, um, Alicia Elliott, uh, Siku Alulu, and then Joseph Boyden was also there. Oh. <laughs> so that was interesting. That was very interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't think he <laughs> expected um, or understood what it was like being in a room of like very outspoken indigenous women and men. So that was, that was interesting. Um, but during that time, I really thought about incorporating memoir with investigative journalism. I mean, for the most part, as a journalist, you're told never to put yourself in the story. Right. So that was <laughs> sort of a thing already, but, um, you know, my my agent, Samantha Haywood, and my editor, Jennifer Crawl, really encouraged me to to put more of myself in there. And then it was kind of like, well, how about, here's an opportunity to put more and more. And I was like, whoa, this is a lot. And didn't want to take away from the stories of those who didn't survive. You know, I'm a survivor of violence, but I didn't want to overshadow, you know, the, the stories of those um, family members whose loved ones didn't survive. But I think it was... A really good move because it allowed for people to see me as sort of like an anchor um, telling these stories from a known perspective you know understanding what the child welfare system is like understanding you know the depths of residential school of colonial violence of genocide and really being able to showcase the whole picture you know not just how these systems operate in silos but really how they work as a collective machine to continue with colonial violence. So it was, it was a difficult process, you know, telling my story um, in the book was healing to some degree. I was just listening to this podcast about cults and they were talking about how writing a book is very healing, but they don't tell you, well, then you release the book and then you're subjected to you know, I've only had like maybe two sort of bad in well, what I would call bad interviews that are like very traumatic. Um, but then the lineup where people line up to sign up their books mm -hmm. and a lot of people, you know, at first I would call that like people would take it, especially non-Indigenous people, take it as an opportunity to sort of trauma bond. Now I'm kind of seeing it as a different way. Like, okay, maybe this is just a space for people to connect. Um and I really try to really connect, not like I'm this amazing person that you're like in awe with, but like, who are you, you know, and what, and let's actually connect as human beings, having a human experience in this world together. Um, so it's been a, it's been a journey, but it's been a really beautiful and powerful journey at the same time. Mm. Awesome. How did you know when you were finished writing all you wanted to say in the book? Mm. Mm, I've never been asked that question before. How did I know? I mean, it's, you could be like editing forever, right? You could be adding things or taking things out or should I do this and making decisions? 
Um, but I think that's what's amazing about my publisher, Greystone, is that they have an incredible team of incredibly skilled editors. I think my book went to went through three or four different layers of edits, um, as well as we had a fact check, which I've heard is very rare in the book world, which is astonishing. Um, I mean, we don't have that in journalism either, right? We don't have fact checkers. We have editors, um, but we don't have like an official fact checker. So I had many layers of eyes, lawyers on the book. And I think my my editor, Jennifer Kroll, was just so incredible at making the book a complete story, right? I was used mm. to writing like a bunch of little stories for news. So that's kind of how she received it. And then she's like, we need to make this one book, like one story. Um, and yeah, I've never really thought about that. I don't, I don't know if I, I mean, I, I definitely could have just kept on going editing and editing and editing, but I feel like I definitely, it's a story of my life. So it, it ended where I'm at, where I was at then, which I think was, I think the, the last chapter is sort of about, um, the reckoning that we saw in media, um, in 2000 when did i finish the book 2022 it was supposed to be published at the end of 2022 but it ended up being published at the beginning of 2023 right. so yeah that's the beauty about memoirs that i mean you kind of you're you're done when when you're talking about i guess where you're at at this present day moment right yeah yeah and um can you tell us a bit about building your storytelling skills as a youth with mentors and, and learning in the field and kind of like the beginning of, of that journey? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know if I had any, like as a, as a teenager, I don't know if I had um, writers that I looked up to per se. I always was drawn to stories. I was always drawn to revolutionary stories I loved the story of Asada Shakur, <laughs> who somehow escaped prison. I just loved that book so much and that whole story. Um, I was really drawn to um, sports autobiographies, and I still am. I don't know if people watched the story. I think it was called Nai Naya Naiga Naiga. It's about a six-year-old woman who swam from like Florida to Cuba. Uh -huh. uh, I love stories like that. I yeah. really, they really, even though I never played sports, I was a competitive swimmer yeah. um, and a martial artist, but I never was in team sports, but I love stories about, I guess, like the underdog winning, but I don't know if I ever had, I had like people who saw my gifts and I talk about that a lot. Yeah. So now um, I don't do journalism right now. I was just too burnt out from it, but I do keynote talks. I do motivational talks all over um, Canada and the US. And one of the things I talk about is a, uh, a group home parent who saw my gift of writing and really you know, introduced me to the power of the pen. Um, and then having teachers just, just see me and see like, yeah, you might be wearing a black hoodie at the back of the class and, you know, be really shy and introverted and might not be super chatty and smiley, but you're amazing. Like you're a writer, you're a speaker, you're an excellent communicator. And that experience through that teacher, Donna Brack, the first person I talked about was Tom Littlewood and the second person, Donna Brack. I mean, she was a teacher at a, a learning center that I worked at when I was, or that I was studied at when I was getting my grade 12 um, she introduced me sort of to journalism through co-op radio. There was like a job advertisement on one of the polls at the, at the center. And she was like, you should apply. And that was my entry point to journalism was telling really long, like for now, I mean, podcast maybe, but, um, like hour long audio documentaries, uh, about, um, Canadian and Latin American development issues. And, yeah, so I don't know if I ever really had mentors. Like, I'd really want to be this person when I grow up. I don't know if I ever had that, but I had people who saw me and they saw my gifts, and I wouldn't probably be where I'm at if it weren't for them. Totally. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about... Um, uh, Diana Nyad. Nyad, thank you, yeah. Diana. Um, 
uh, silence uh, to erase and eradicate Indigenous women's voices and like writing against that silence. Writing against the eradication and yeah, so so being being that that voice when you know for so long um, you know Indigenous women's voices generally weren't being heard in the in the media. What was it like? Was that your question or? Yeah, or you know, um, yeah, right, right, writing uh, from that uh, perspective, uh, working for you know a large a large broadcaster, you know, you write in the book about a lot of the you know racism and you know um, working in a predominantly white newsroom and you know f finding your your voice um, must have been you know quite a, a process. Yeah, I was just talking about that today with a journalist um, who covered this event or is covering this event. And we were just talking about how far journalism has come in some regards, you know, the the public facing aspects in terms of, um, and I always have people say, I can't believe you went through that, like CBC and mainstream media outlets, they seem amazing today. Like there's so many stories on Indigenous people, you know, populating the websites, which is so true. Like over the last 10 years, there's been so much distance achieved when it comes to highlighting indigenous stories and voices in the mainstream media. I think there's still a very long way to go in particular, how, you know, indigenous and black journalists are treated inside the newsroom. There's still a lot of um, either sort of romanticization about who we are, which really takes me back, you know, like 60 years. And then there's a lot of vilification. And then there's just a lot of ignorance. You know, people would sit on the edge of my desk and um, ask me very one-on-one -on -one questions, um, even in 2017, or a lot of questions that would assume um, that colonial violence was somehow good for Indigenous people. <laughs> Um, a lot of really harmful comments and attitudes and perspectives that are still, unfortunately, still the norm. You know, and I always tell people, you know, you can hire as many Indigenous people as you want, but until you actually change the culture of an institution, those places are never going to be safe for us because you will be hiring all these people and the message that you're um putting out there to the employees is assimilate or leave, assimilate to this culture or leave. And I think we're told in many different ways, you know, especially as Indigenous women, um, that we just don't belong and that we're just, we're not, our, our voices as Indigenous people are not um, appreciated. And I think the, the, the Indigenous journalists that do really well in mainstream media are the ones who, for example, I had a uh, a Métis journalist tell me like, I don't like it when people call me indigenous journalist because I'm a journalist first. And I was like, interesting, because I'm an indigenous woman first. That is my identity. My identity isn't my job. My identity is who I am and where I'm from and, and all of the multi dimensions that that takes on. But a journalist is, is my job. Um, and I think it's so important that we have um, cultures in institutions where people are respected for not just what they look like, but who they represent and how they represent. And, you know, speaking out against racism or genocide shouldn't be seen as a bad thing. It should be seen as a, a boon to the culture. We want people who are not racist, <laughs> um, but it's sort of the opposite, you know, takes place. And, you know, we're seeing that right now and we're seeing people being fired for speaking out about genocide taking place in another country. And people are like, that's shocking. And I'm like, from Canada, are you serious? Like we've been told in multiple ways that genocide didn't exist here from journalists as well. Journalists were the first to speak out and say, you know, the missing and murdered indigenous women's national inquiry um, got it wrong when they said a genocide existed in Canada. Journalists were the first to gather up their experts and find a way to say that that's not right, that that you can't use that word to describe what happened in Canada. Um, so I thought that was super interesting because, you know, as much as I'm critical of um, the Canadian government of the day, um, 
you know, and, and I'm not, I didn't vote for Justin Trudeau. I don't think he's amazing, but he came out and said, I agree, a genocide happened here. And so you have the Canadian government of the day, you know, maybe apologizing or admitting or facing the truth and journalists can't. And we're the gatekeepers of information, right? We're the ones that people look to for the facts. And so when you have a group of journalists saying in so many words, you know, colonial violence didn't happen, it's not happening, genocide didn't happen, in so many words that, you know, Indigenous people are raced, people listen, you know, the public listens to that. So I think as much as there's been incredible um, distances that the media has come in terms of writing about Indigenous people, at least the bare minimum, there's still a long, long way to go in terms of how Indigenous people are treated in the newsroom and then the types of stories that are told and from whose perspective and what they're supporting and the type of biases that still exists within media from a colonial perspective, the colonial bias. Yeah, yeah, no. And um, that really feeds into like how you end the book talking about um, the story with the Bank of Montreal and the um, Haltzuk, um grandfather and granddaughter and, you know, how that, you know, has, has, has just played out and, um, you know, how tides have really shifted in, in the way that that story was picked up, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, do you think the media is becoming less racist toward Indigenous people? Is it more positive and, and representative overall? Or um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think people always ask me, well, what changed? And I say, well, metrics changed when we were able to see who was reading what story for how long. You know, we can see not just how many clicks are on a story, but how long people are reading it for. And so the average length of time I think people read a story for is like tops 40 seconds. So when you have an Indigenous story that's super contextualized, it's about colonial violence, modern day, and then you have, you know, people reading on it, people on the story for a minute, 59 seconds, and there's a million hits on it. That really showed the newsroom, like, and the leaders, you know, predominantly white, if not all white, were saying, oh, this matters to people. We have to cover this more. Um, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Um, where I think we're really kind of falling down is... I mean, how many people have exited mainstream media who are Indigenous, right? It's like just been this massive exodus, especially when it comes to, um, you know, award-winning Indigenous women journalists who weren't treated well by mainstream media and left. And you know, I'm thinking of Connie Walker. She went on to win a Peabody and a Pulitzer Prize mm -hmm. and is on the front of Time magazine, right? Those are the types of people that mainstream media in Canada spits out um, and, and don't appreciate. And that's really sad. Um, again, like I think if you can show up and maybe look diverse and be diverse, but um, not ruffle any feathers in the newsroom, not, you know, speak truth to power, not, you know, it's, it's one thing to be an Indigenous woman and have to do your job. 12 times harder than anybody else. And I always, you know, I have to tell my son that like, you're indigenous, you have to work 10 times harder than anybody else. Otherwise, you're going to get called all of the stereotypes, lazy, incompetent, dirty, whatever. Um, so not only do you have to work, and there's data to back that up, actually, I'm doing my next book, and I, I'm looking at this massive data bank on um, gender roles, and people of color, women of color have to work 12 times as harder and get paid sometimes the same, sometimes less. Um, but not only that, but then you're subjected to so many different layers of racism. And I appreciate the term microaggression, but like a lot of what I witnessed and saw was just straight up racism, um, straight up ableism, um, straight up making fun of people who were not white men, um, egregious, egregious. Yeah. And so you know, you're doing your job 
you know, you're working so hard, but then you're fighting against all of this racism. And then on top of that, pushing for stories where everyone's like, mm, I don't really see that as a story. I don't really get it. It's too complicated for me. I think we should just do this really, you know, story that everyone's on board with. This the story that I did about Maxwell Johnson, yeah. that was rejected at first. Yeah. I was told, yeah, great story, but it's a bit, it's a bit much. It's a bit complicated. So I'm going to take a pass. So stories that I've pitched like that, you can just imagine how powerful that story was to the public. It went international. How many stories that I and other Black, Indigenous, and people of color st people stories that we pitched that were rejected. And people always tell me that. They say, you know, there's so many things that aren't covered. Like, it's like living in two different worlds as an Indigenous person. And so it's sad when they lose, you know, journalists who could be telling the truth from a very different perspective that is needed. We need um, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And so, you know, that required your like constant advocacy, I guess, to be like pitching. And then when something like the uh, Maxwell Johnson story got turned down, like turning to, you know, other producers, I guess, to keep. Yeah, I, I went for that story. I went to a producer who's awesome and an, an incredible Catherine Rolfson. She's yeah. An incredible journalist. Um, she was my producer on the podcast Land Back. And she was like, oh, yeah, we're covering this immediately. And I'm like, it's going to go bonkers. She's like, I know. We'll free you up for everything. So uh, incredible allies you need to have, right? You need to still have white allies in the newsroom because that's the power. Um, but, yeah, you need to. I, and I should say something, too. So in the newsroom, being called an advocate is like a huge insult. Um, being called an advocacy journalist is like a diss, um, which is super interesting because when you're any race of investigative journalists, like the biggest thing that you desire is to have impact and to create change. But somehow when you're an indigenous person and you want that same impact and you want that same change, you're called an advocate, right? And so there's just there's a lot of colonial bias that still needs to be unpacked and and just faced really in newsrooms in Canada. Absolutely. All right. So um, this is uh, more of an in, intense question, kind of connecting some of the dots for folks this evening. So in in the book, you talk about some brutal statistics like Indigenous women being seven times more likely to be murdered by a serial killer than non-Indigenous women, and how the MMIWG crisis in Canada is directly linked to colonization and residential schools. Can you tell our audience about how these facts are interrelated? Sorry, in, in a um, residential school and MMIWG? Yeah, and, you know, how, how the effects of, of colonization is, you know, directly linked to the MMIWG crisis. Mm. I mean, there's so many, there's so many different ways of unpacking that and looking at it from so many different angles. Absolutely. I think yeah. one of the things that I, that I talk about in my talks now is um, the reserve system in Canada, right? And how that created a level of unsafety for Indigenous women and girls in particular along the Highway of Tears. And so you have a situation at the, you know, at the height of colonization where I, I literally had a guy who was filming me for something recently. And he said, when my ancestors came here, there was just all this free land for them. <laughs> and I said, amazing. That was my people's land that you were stealing. <laughs> but settlers actually got free land or land on sale because they were like uprooting indigenous people and by law forcing us onto small tracts of land called reserves that were on unfertile land. They were often far flung away from our traditional territories, away from our um, fishing holes, away from our hunting grounds. Um, and it was illegal to hunt and fish. You could go to jail. You could go to prison in many ways. Uh, in many um, communities, there was a pass system. So you needed a visa to leave the reserve. And so, you know, one of the women that I talked to along the Highway of Tears, who's niece Lana Derrick went missing near to the same time Ramona Wilson went missing in the 90s 
was, well, what would you do if you were a mom? Um, you're basically forced into the situation of racialized poverty um, and you want milk or you need food for your children. You know, you're forced into poverty. You're forced really far away from the convenience of settler society. Well, you'd be forced to hitchhike, right? And so a lot of these systems just created a, 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 a mammoth level of unsafety for Indigenous women and girls. You know, the murders and disappearances along the highway tiers started before the 60s, but we didn't see a reliable transportation system along the highway tiers until 2018, 2019. We didn't see, and there's still spotty up there, but a, a semblance of cell service until 2022, right? So there's still a lot of um, real deficits when it comes to providing human security for Indigenous women and girls. And so many of the systems, I mean, I could speak all, I could speak for days about this, about how these systems mm -hmm. communicate and interact with each other to create this these systems of unsafety. Um, but it's it's um, it's still continuing today, right? It's not something that happened in the past. Sorry, my cats. My cats agreeing with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Um, uh, oh, uh, really important. Um, can you tell us about um, covering stories where? Um, investigations aren't handled properly by police um, and how as a journalist you're in this you know very tough position you're often considered biased biased as an indigenous journalist where others uh, would be considered experts and you know how how you've navigated this yeah that's a great question I mean <clears throat> I think one of the the deficits of the great failures of media that continues today is our um our bias towards police right so when it comes to missing and murdered indigenous women and girls i mean for me and and this is an it, listen to any true crime podcast who do you go to right i heard laura palmer talking about she kind of has two circles that she begins with and they both overlay i don't know kind of like a venn diagram but you know, the one circle is the family, right? So mom, dad, cousins, who she might have grown up with. And then the other circle is people who she spent her last days with, right? Friends, cousins, um, you know, whatever circle she was with. Um, for media, for the news media, I mean, we just go to the police immediately <laughs> and we take everything that they say as absolute fact, like absolute fact, last word, everything. And the family members are sort of like, mm, I just think it's astonishing. It's astonishing the level of power that we give police. Police, I think, do, you know, in some regards, do great work, really important work, really, really difficult work for probably not nearly as much pay, unsafe work. Um, there's some cops doing really incredible investigation work, right? I'm thinking of Laura Merchener, who really tried his damnedest to bust open the Picton investigations and was really um, had a lot of roadblocks put in front of him. But the 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 level of power and lasse and voice that we give police to this day and sort of like the family members, family members are a second thought. It, it's it's mind blowing. So you have a situation, for example, where I believe it was in in Duncan, BC, there was a young Indigenous woman who was found under pallets, under garbage, and the police were like, "Oh, we we are, we're, we've already we've already done our investigation on this, and it's not suspicious, um, right?" And so, so then you have this like highly suspicious death, but the police are saying we've done our investigation and it's wrapped up; it's not suspicious. It just makes absolutely no sense. Um, and the other problem, I think, with policing in Canada is just how highly secretive they are, right? And so they won't give you an, any information. They will just give you the bare minimum. And so you're trying to get answers. Even for my book, I had to file several freedom of information requests and ATIPs just trying to get the bare minimum. Like, what were you doing? Who's a suspect? Was this person cleared? Was this person still... Um, you know, 
under a cloud of suspicion, like what is what's happening with this. So it's, it's a, it's a problem in media to this day. And it's, it's, it's fascinating, really, how that still continues to go on, where it's just, you know, a, a press release or a quote put out by police can be an entire story. Um, and it's, it's um, especially damning today when we see how, you know, defunded the media is right now, you know, it's falling apart. And so it's just these quick and dirty stories. And when you rely so heavily on the police, you're getting a very slim margin of the truth. Our draw jobs are to tell the truth and you need multiple voices to do that, not one voice. So it's a big problem in this country. And for my book, it required um, a lot of investigation, a lot of questions, a lot of digging deep. And I will say for my book, what was interesting was talking to the exact same communications person as I would in news. And they were so nice. Hmm. <laughs> then the news, they were just like, I mean, I've, I've received emails that weren't meant for me where it was like, you know, Angela Starrett's not even a real journalist, that type of thing. And just oh. very, um, never giving me answers, never giving me even a statement, whereas all the other journalists are getting statements. But then for my book being like incredibly helpful, it was really strange. It was very, wow. very strange. Like I'm talking the amount that the RCMP, I don't know if this was, I don't think I got any quotes from the VPD, but probably the RCMP, I mean, it was maybe hundreds of questions I asked them and they answered like as much as they could. They were very helpful. Um, but then in news, it was like totally different story, yeah. probably because they knew how the news cycle works, right? And how many eyes would be on it at a certain time and place. Right. Yeah, no, completely. Um, can you tell us about what you've been working on recently? Yeah, so I probably shouldn't share the news too early, but um I am writing a new book and I can give more details about that probably in a few days. Yeah. Um, but I'm super excited. Um, it's a whole new topic, but it's sort of like a sequel to Unbroken as well. Um, it's a whole journey. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a motivational speaker now. I love it. I love yeah. walking spaces. People are happy to see me. People are joyful people are empowered people love to hear the truth yes. um i haven't spent a day crying <laughs> as a result of my job since september which is when i quit my other job yeah. um yeah so i'm writing my new book i'm doing these motivational talks and then a couple other projects which i won't say yet either because i should okay. be more careful but yeah. but yeah i I love, I love it. My, my nervous system is in love with its new situation. <laughs> wow. No, congratulations. That's all very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. Can you, do you have any advice for young indigenous journalists and media producers? I mean, I mean, one thing I would tell people is that although my journey was really tough, for one, I would never recommend. Um, that was brutal. I saw a chart where it was like the 10 stages of burnout. And I'm like, whoa, I've been at 12 for like years, like years and years and years. But do I regret it? No. Um, you know, I'm really proud of the work that I did. And I'm really proud of the changes that I made. Um, the stories that I did, it's, I talked to a journalist today um, and I was like, oh, I miss this. Just talking to people about big ideas. And, you know, I will say, you know, some of the, the publications, um, like I'm thinking the Walrus, um, the Taiyi, um, like some of, I don't know if they would be considered mainstream or not. It's so hard to tell these days, but I mean, the Taiyi I loved, I, you know, when it when my pitches were just completely rejected by mainstream news, the Taiyi was like, yes, we'll take everything you have. And I loved it. It was incredible. I got to write long form, like very um, tons of sources, like 10 sources per story. I love talking to people. 
Um, and that was, you know, it, for me, it wasn't a place to cut my teeth. It was a place where I could do really developed, long form, multidimensional journalism that, you know, might have not had the same types of eyes on it as mainstream media, but maybe it does now. Because who watches TV? Like who goes to the streaming sites? And I don't, you know, I, I have Netflix and, you know, I have all the streaming shows, but I would never go to like, let's see what's going on for streaming for these news sites. You know, that's just not how we gather news anymore. Um, but I would, I would highly recommend um, journalists just reach out to, to publications that might not seem to have the same amount of corporate power behind them because that's where you're going to be able to do real journalism that you know and i think now there's there's a lot more space in the world of journalism to have smaller publications for example be seen side by side you know in the beside the larger markets so yeah that's my advice and just always write i hear from a lot of writers like how do i start I'm like just start writing just start writing your ideas and read that's really Wabagish Rice told me that if you want to have good writing, you need to read. And Tanya Talaga, for example, I didn't know how to write a book. So I was like, how do I read a book? Like, I don't even know how to construct. So I would read Tanya Talaga's books, like really as a, as a instructions manual for how to do it. And now I have time to read, but read and consume as much as you can about what you want to write about. Um, and and have have mentors, you know, have people that are like, I want to be like that. You know, when I was just starting, the person I really looked up to was Wab Canoe. He was in my newsroom and I was like, oh, you can just do that. You can just be indigenous and write about indigenous stories. And he was so badass and he just he just did it. He was like, I'm going to do a story about this indigenous boxing club today. And I was like, that's awesome. Like incredible and he made so many changes he made so many incredible changes um but it's different when you're a man <laughs> in this society right our, our society really has its clutches in patriarchy and so it is a lot easier for i think even indigenous men to sort of float through those systems with a little bit more ease than for example an indigenous woman um but but still, that was that was a huge role model for me. I just wanted to do what he was doing. And Wabi Gijek Rice, too, in the in the writing world, I always look at him like you're what you're doing is amazing. And then Connie Walker, like, oh, my God, she's like she needs a private jet, you know, <laughs> or whatever the sustainable equivalent to that is. She needs. Um, yeah, she's just amazing and deserves every single accolade she's getting and will get. Um, all right. So I'll ask, uh, one more and then we'll get to some of our audience questions. Uh, what actions would you like to see attendees take away tonight as ways they can engage on this issue in their own communities? Hmm. I would say to, instead of thinking about how to save Indigenous people or help Indigenous people, I would say to reflect on you and your ancestors and how we got here. It's not a guilt and a shame thing. It's just a curiosity, right? If you want to build compassion for people, you need to have curiosity about yourself and some of the behaviors that might have got us to this point. For Indigenous people right now, we should be rebuilding our cultural institutions relearning our languages, speaking our languages, building up our people, getting our land back, our children back, our love back. On my white side, I need to be critical of the systems that my people created. So that shouldn't be the job of Indigenous people to say, like, how do we deconstruct or dismantle these systems? That, sh that shouldn't be Indigenous people's problems. That should be on my white side, um, what we're focused on. How can I disrupt, dismantle, reimagine these systems so they're beneficial for all not just for white supremacy so that is what i would say and have the courage to speak up have the courage to use your voice it shouldn't always be the one indigenous person or the black person or the person of color 
in your office who's saying, I don't think that's right. Or can I ask you what you meant by that? It's exhausting. We're burning out. Um, but I, I do do that because I take my white privilege seriously. So I think to just say, is it about saving or um, helping, you know, a people who, um, you know, my people might have hurt or are hurting? Or is it about facing a reality and trying to understand those colonial systems? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So um, I have some questions for you from uh, folks at the time of registration that uh, were sent in. Um, so if you do have a question for Angela, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we will try and address as many as we can this evening. So the first one is, I'm interested in recommendations for teachers to address these issues in school. What are these issues? Um, I think they're referring to MMIWG uh, and decolonization. Again, I think it's being critical of the systems, right? So being critical or even just having knowledge of the reserve system, um, how the police started out Right. The RCMP started out as the Northwest uh, Mounted Police that was really set up to clear the land of Indigenous people. Right. Understanding the systems that are in place that continue to marginalize Indigenous women and girls. Um, I think understanding um, patriarchy. Right. Having a critical analysis of patriarchy and white supremacy is is absolutely critical. Really, yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on how the media can be held accountable for its role in perpetuating racist stereotypes of our people, especially our women? Educating people has not proven to be very effective in my point of view. Yeah. I mean, the public has a tremendous amount of power um, when it comes to uh, like the audience. The audience, at least in my experience, is taken very seriously when it comes to complaints from the from the public, um, whether it's an ombudsman's complaint or a correction in a story. Um, you know, and I always tell people that's why there were changes in the media is because the public was sort of vo voting with their clicks. Like, I think this story is really important. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm also and supporting local media, right? Supporting Indigenous, supporting the discourse, supporting the Tai, supporting, you know, incredible um, journalists, Michelle Seesaw, who's doing such great work at the Walrus now, the Narwhal, supporting those um, publications, I think is really critical at this time. Totally. Uh, how can settlers, you kind of already answered this, but um, how can settlers make ourselves more knowledgeable about Indigenous issues and history? How can we, we reach out to our Indigenous neighbours? I always, I just think that's, I don't, I don't know. Like, I just, I think that question is so interesting. How do we reach out? At, like, how do you reach out to your neighbor? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that's just like, like, are, is there, are we, like, we're not animals, right? Yeah. Like, it's not like, oh, don't make eye contact or like we're human beings. Like reach out how you would reach out anybody else, but don't be weird about it. Oh. Don't be like, hi, I, you know, I'd love for you to educate me. Like, I, 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 it just blows my mind when I get this question because yeah. for one, if you don't know what to do, like there's, there's literally 5,000 calls to action on the internet right now from the TRC, from MMIWG National Inquiry, um, from Murray Sinclair's uh, previous work on justice. There's just so much out there. And so, and yeah, I don't, I don't know how you would reach out, like, you know, build relationships with people, but I don't know how to tell you how to do that. Cause it's very, individualistic yeah yeah 
Sure, for sure. What would you most want to communicate to international visitors to BC when they ask about the red dresses they see? Hmm. Hmm. International visitors. I would say just, I mean, I think I hear a lot of people when they first arrived in Canada, they heard a lot of misinformation about Indigenous people, like all the stereotypes. And to really think about honoring, you know, the Indigenous women and girls and two spirit people and non binary relatives. Um, gender diverse relatives, but also the men and boys like know that we are still here. Um, but there's been a tremendous effort by way of the church and the state and the media to silence us. And when you see those red dresses, it's an opportunity to learn, but also an opportunity to speak out and to be curious um, and be mindful that our country is very, very, very um, bias towards white supremacy um, and just to question, ask questions. Totally, yeah. What tangible responses have been made by authorities such as RCMP, transit authorities and others to ensure greater safety for women and girls in high risk areas such as the Highway of Tears? Yeah. So yeah, the affordable transportation system, I mean, it's a little late, right? Like decades and decades have passed since people have gone missing, in particular Indigenous women and girls um, from the area. So, you know, the family members of the women and girls who had gone missing from the Highway of Tears had a symposium in 2006, and they had a number of calls to action. People should absolutely read that and go through it and see you know, how many have been um, completed. You know, one of the things with cell service, again, that's still spotty in that area. Um, and there's some coverage in some areas since 2022, but there's a lot of outstanding um, issues that need to be addressed. Absolutely. What are some supports, uh, structural changes you wish you had as a young Indigenous journalist starting out in a largely white settler newsroom? People speaking out. You know, just one person saying, I think that's a good story. Or one person saying, I also think that's racist. Or, you know, I, I at some points in my career, I had people step in, but... Even if someone would have said, do you think that's a little bit too much over scrutiny and surveillance of Indigenous journalists? Like, do you think, you know, if someone would have said something, the amount of apologies I got when I left, where were those people when I was there? Yeah. Right. To, to say this isn't right. Like, you're not being treated right. Or even to say, I agree, that's a great story as well. Um just you know that's that's what i wished is that somebody would have spoke out um and it's easy like and i'll give people an example so one of the first stops on my book tour was at a prison and the person organizing the book tour was a white older woman and it was all these inmates and a lot of them were white and um a couple of them were being really racist. Like they were saying, it shouldn't be Black Lives Matter. It should be All Lives Matter. And that white woman just shut it down. She was like, that's not accurate. This is why it's wrong. And just like spoke truth to power and educated the woman. And I was, cause I didn't know what to do. Like I wasn't, I, that was the first time I'd stepped into that prison. I wasn't sure how it worked. I also, it's exhausting to be the only one. And I'm like, that is how it's done. I was never witnessing that in my newsroom, someone to speak out and say, actually, this is wrong, right? When it was like speaking out against diversity hires or woke culture, or whatever um, was being said that was harmful to diverse people, no one spoke out, never. Mm -hmm. So that would have helped a lot. And I don't know what prevents people from speaking out when they have so much power mm -hmm. um, other than relationships and friendships they don't want to harm. 
they'd rather just continue sort of ensuring that certain people in the newsroom feel ostracized. That's unfortunate. Yeah, for sure. You're saying that people apologized when you left? Wow. For not saying anything. Wow. Um, what kind of response did your story create in your community as well as other communities? Um, my book? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, a book, releasing a book is so different than releasing a news story. So you just, it's so different. So for example, I did a story um, about a Gixan girl, child who was being removed from her family um, or my Land Back podcast. And it was just constant discussions with Gixans about the story and how incredible it was. And writing a book is just so much diff so different, I think in part because there's many different stories and in part because it's so personal, it's hard to see an impact. I mean, mostly I hear about my book in the lineups when people are signing. Um, and maybe it's just so overwhelming for me because it's so much of like emotional connection rather than, oh my God, like that's so incredible that this is happening or this isn't happening anymore. Um, so it's it's really hard to measure with the book, I find. I, I will say that people feel um, are connecting with it. Yeah. As a survivor of the child welfare system, what would you like to see a reimagined system encompass in order to better serve families and children? So... Right now, the way that it works is um, Indigenous children are overrepresented in the child welfare system in some provinces as much as 70%. Um, when you take apart the reasons, when you look at the, the reasons why Indigenous children are taken away, the reason, like I've seen the forms, is neglect. That could mean they don't have a warm coat. That could mean... Um, they're sent to school without a lunch. So poverty, right? And I, you know, when I was just explaining the reserve system, like we were forced into poverty. Literally, that is what colonization set out to achieve. Um, and so then what the system does, their system right now, is then they give all of this money to foster parents to raise the Indigenous children that have been removed for poverty reasons. So why not, if it's just poverty, why not put resources into the family, right? If it's issues with parenting, why not put in resources? Or there's so many instances in so many of the stories that I've covered where there was an auntie, there was a grandma, there was uh, a close cousin who was super able and willing to not only take in that child, but co-raise it, right? There's so many opportunities in our community of extended family that are missed by child welfare. Um, and you'd be probably surprised, um, the non-Indigenous community would be surprised at how often it is that Indigenous people are flagged. You know, I was flagged at one point and I was in utter shock that I was being investigated. Um, people know me, it, it was just completely um, wild how often this happens and how much just as an Indigenous person you're over scrutinized and over surveilled and discriminated against and you have all these stereotypes pummeled upon you despite how much money you have how well of a life you live how great of a parent you are you're constantly being flagged or you're constantly um, kind of hyper vigilance to having your your child taken away. So, um, yeah, it's uh, like I just I, it never made sense to me in the child welfare system. Why not put resources into the actual family? You know, it's it's the most devastating thing that could ever happen to you, having your child taken away from you. It's like devastating for years and years and years. It's so traumatic. So instead of causing more trauma, why not just provide resources that you obviously have because you're giving them to the foster parents? It's mind-blowing. 
how the system is and how how much it fails indigenous people absolutely i'm just gonna um pause for a moment and encourage folks to put your questions into the uh q a box at the bottom of your screen if you would like to ask angela a question now would be the time to uh ask uh, by typing it in the Q&A box uh, so that we can ensure we get to uh, as many questions as we can here. Um, I have another one for you. They're asking about um, the uh, TRC um, acknowledges cultural genocide. What are your thoughts about the term cultural genocide? That's a good question, a good, great question. I mean, Murray Sinclair, talked about that. I mean, I think if you look up, like right now, people want to go look up what is the United Nations definition on genocide. It is the forcible removal of a group of children out of their culture into another culture. Like that's literally one of the definitions of genocide, not cultural genocide, but just genocide. So it's, it's astonishing to me the amount of mental gymnastics that people will go through to to diminish or to dilute um, or to gaslight um, indigenous ex indigenous people and in, in diminish indigenous experiences in Canada. You know, we just we don't want to admit that it was bad here or that it is bad here. We just are so clingy to the idea that there's been no mistakes made here and we're just such a wonderful country um but for indigenous people the the opposite of of that is true so it's a great question i was kind of shocked when marie sinclair said cultural genocide is what we're going to go with i'm not sure what his reasoning behind that was after he you know from the, the other thing i thought that was shocking was you know in June 21st of 2021, people were like, oh, I had no idea that children were, you know, didn't survive residential school. But like in 2015, like we talked about that. It's in the final report that 6,000 at least children died as a result of residential school. So it was, um, but, 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 you know, Murray Sinclair was part of that report. So it was a bit shocking to me to, to learn or to hear him say cultural instead of genocide i'm not sure what the decision making around that was possibly look what happened when the mmiwg national inquiries commissioners used the word right journalists just railed against them so possibly that was a um a strategic move mm -hmm. okay you you don't have to answer this but someone is wondering would you consider a career in politics no <laughs> <laughs> No, no, never, <laughs> never. Yeah. No, okay. I'm also, I don't know if people know this, but I'm an artist. Like I also did the cover of my book. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I kind of, I'm like that kind of like dreamy, idealistic. Um, like I'm very, I can't remember the, the, the right and left or AB types, but I'm very A type. Like I get things done. I have to finish a project. I'm very di diligent, you know, um, but I'm also like, I'm an artist, like I'm very dreamy and I'm very idealistic and I love using my imagination. Um, and I'm funny, believe it or not, <laughs> but I just, I don't see where any of those things would be useful to politics. Yeah. So, um, no, maybe when I'm retire, I don't know. <laughs> In, in this lifetime, no. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, are some of your talks for teenage girls? And I think they mean um, you're like motivational. Yeah, I gave a talk. Um, so I gave a talk a few days ago in Prince Rupert and it was amazing. It was like, I'd say like 95% indigenous women. It was incredible. Lots were young women and lots came up to me. I had, when I was in Lethbridge, Alberta, I had a teenager come up to me and she was so goth and like black, like she looked like me as a teen. And I was, I was just like, try not to cry. Cause I was like, you, she was like, getting her book signed. And I was like, you're reading my book. Like it just meant the world. Um, and then I gave a talk after the one in Prince Rupert in Burnaby on Saturday. And there was a lot of young people there and young people like teenagers, like low key scare me because they're so intense. Like they're going through a really powerful time, like in their life, right? Like puberty, but also just 
becoming coming into their own like it's such a powerful time but i think a lot of systems take that away from them but i think there's there's a lot going on for them so they're tough they're a tough crowd and i guess so i'm always like nervous around when i speak to them and i've spoken to like native ed to the the high school or the adult school um but i apparently there was all these young high school students and i guess they were just listening to my every word and i was like oh i'm so glad i didn't know they were there <laughs> cuz they're they're just so intense they kind of scare me they're amazing um but uh yeah i mean everything i do is for i hope for young people giving them hope like you can do anything like literally anything is attainable yeah uh someone else is wondering how can we support you um you know what right now in my life i'm so well resourced you know like since i quit my job um i don't think people know how much i don't know about other journalists but the amount i got paid was brutal so low just i lived in dire poverty as a single mom it was just so rough so tense like barely making it um now i'm abundant i'm like loved cared for i just feel so supported i mean there's a lot of hate on on um there's a lot of hate on on twitter <laughs> um i i love it when people are able to like speak out and be like that's wrong um but yeah people just speaking out speaking out when you see something going going wrong and it doesn't have to be super hardcore you can just ask questions like what are you trying to say or but I just find there's such a culture of of almost disciplining those who speak out that people are afraid to do so but utilize your power and your privilege by using your voice. You know, whether that's through a pen or through your vocal cords or whatever however you do through art whatever but people need to have the courage to speak out. And that's helpful. Definitely. Um how do you feel about non-Indigenous journalists writing Indigenous stories? I think it's important. Like I'm seeing a lot of um, younger women journalists right now doing, you know, doing stories about Indigenous communities and doing a really good job. Um, and I think that's important. Um, making sure that all your sources on Indigenous stories are Indigenous. I remember first moving back to Vancouver and there was a whole story about the indigenous history of Stanley Park. And it was like a 20 minute interview with a white anthropologist guy. Mm. And I was like, there's so many opportunities, like just phone the band office up and be like, Hey, I'm doing this story or go on Facebook. Like that's where indigenous people live, make connections, but make sure that if you're doing an indigenous story, it's all indigenous sources, not, um, white anthropologists that's still being done too. Mm. I see that all the time. It just, it's mind blowing to me. It's like you were, we're in a different time. Like there's, you know, that there's indigenous people who are also anthropologists, but are also from that community who are archeologists, who are scientists, who are just incredible cultural leaders, who are spiritual leaders, who are elders. Like there's, there's no excuse anymore for not having indigenous people in your stories. It's always better, I think, to have um, people from those communities write about those, but it's becoming few and far between from what I see to have indigenous people, especially in mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Completely. Uh, someone is mentioning a book called White Women, Everything You Need to Know About Your Own Racism and How to Do Better Ooh. by Regina Jackson and Syrah Rao. Uh, she awesome. says it is excellent and illuminating. Thank you, Kirsten. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about non-Indigenous teachers teaching BC First Peoples classes in high schools? Um, I have mixed views on that. For one, I think it's it can be scary because in BC, where the curriculum is up to the teacher, so it's really in their own hands. So you can look up a, 
a story that I did on that. So one of the teachers thought this book, um, Suzanne Moody in the Bush, was a story about Indigenous people. So you can Google that if you want it. Um, just Angela Estera plus, I think it's called Susanna Moody in the Bush or something. It's atrocious. So it's a little bit scary to me because I just feel like there's just a big deficit when it comes to understanding or having knowledge. You know, my son was given a book to read about a white police officer who used indigenous culture to punish a boy who'd murdered someone and he was banished to an island so then what it did for my son is my son like when he's learning about you know his coming of age ceremony he's like i don't want to go to an island i'm like we don't do that 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 was written by a white person who misunderstood our culture and so that teacher in particular that was in grade seven he was very responsive because we were all like, "You, sh this is horrible. And he said, I'm so sorry, but I learned about this when I was growing up and I thought it was great. Like that was 40 years ago. <laughs> um, so, and then, then what happens too is then people want us to come in. So I get asked all the time to go and teach for free or for like a hundred dollars. And it's like, well, I shouldn't be teaching you stuff that you should, you should be doing your job. Mm. So I think it comes down to same problem in the newsroom. They need more resources. Like stu like teachers are amazing. They're incredible. Like look at during the pandemic, we saw how incredible they are. But they need resources. They need money to do their job. And when you're paying them next to nothing, how are they supposed to learn about something that they didn't grow up learning? So yeah, I have I have mixed feelings about that, but I but it does come down to the school boards and the government needs to be giving teachers a lot more money. Totally, yeah. Thanks, Diane. She says it's Roughing It in the Bush by Susanna Moody. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Um, someone else is wondering if you've seen the movie An Archived about BC Traditional Archives, another illuminating no. experience, and it's on the Knowledge Network. Ooh. Martha, is it like a critical? Is it an archive? I love docs. If anyone has recommendations of docs or pod, that's all I watch. Yeah. Um, traditional archive, unarchived. Awesome. All right. Uh, I think that's all for for questions that um, have come through here. Anyone else has any last minute questions? You can put them in the Q&A box. Um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. a minute's documentary. And otherwise, yeah. yeah, we'll wrap things up. Awesome. There's the link to it. I won't open that because last time I did that, it shut everything down. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us this evening, Angela? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, not, not that I could think of. Thank you for all the questions and thank you for listening. And um, yeah, keep on, keep on educating yourselves. Um, keep on having curiosity, compassion, and courage. Um, yeah. And uh, before we sign off tonight, I'd also like to invite everyone to visit their local branch, uh, their local library branch, uh, and pick up a little red dress kit to make your own um, little red dress. I don't know if you can see um, my earrings oh, here. That's I'm wearing. awesome. Um, all supplies last. Uh, you can also. Uh, pick up an Indigenous resource guide uh, that we print annually. It has adult, teen, and children's content by Indigenous creators. So encourage you to also um, 
get the 2024 edition. And you can also go online uh, to visit um, our Red Dress Day uh, page. Um, and I'll just put that in the chat for you um, to find uh, more content on MMIWG+, as well as listen to the interview I did uh, last year with um, Brandy Morin. That's also um, a really powerful um, MMIWG+, uh, evening event that um, has a lot of uh, really um, important questions and um, you know, continuing, um, your, your learning and, um, uh, you can find lots, lots more on that, uh, red dress page as well. And yeah, thank you so much, Angela. Um, a big haichka and uh hi sepka uh thanks to all of you for attending and uh there will be a recording of tonight's session uh made available very soon and so i'd like to say ice nate uh good night in halkaminum <laughs>